For three centuries, men and ships have taken their chances in the unforgiving North Atlantic Ocean off the rock-ribbed coast of Labrador. Their goal was codfish. The hazards they faced were legion. This schooner, lost in the Labrador in the summer of 1968, was one of the innumerable victims of those hazards. Fog, uncharted reefs, great gales, and most fearsome of all, the implacable Arctic ice. The ice is spawned in the polar sea. The Labrador current carries it south as a destroying river five to 50 miles broad. As many as 500 little wooden ships once challenged this ice river every spring. Scattered thinly in a labyrinth of sea and rock along the convoluted coast of Newfoundland are the outports where the ships were built and where the men who sailed them were born. Little Bay Island, one such outport, whose men have fished the Labrador for generations. They fish it still. In 1968, they took 10 vessels north into the ice. Amongst them were the youngest and the oldest ships fishing the Labrador. For the long liner, Ashawanapi, completed only in May, it was her maiden venture. For the schooner, Nina W. Corkum, a survivor from the heroic days of sail, it was to be her final voyage. We had the finest kind of skipper men to take us north. Skipper Tom Roberts in the Corkum and Skipper George Jones, who owns both vessels, in the Ashuanapu. Uh, the Labrador fishery is quite a gamble. You can uh, fit out quite heavy, go to the Labrador. There may not be any fish. It is a gamble which uh, Newfoundlanders, I think, they like to take. The uh, crew of the Corkum are shearmen and uh, the cargo of fish, the gross value, is divided in half. 50% of it uh, is sheared up evenly amongst the crew. And their shear last year on the voyage for two months' work was a little in excess of $1,400. It's a big thing, you know, getting ready for the Labrador. There's twine to get ready, the netting for the cod traps, you know. It has to be mended first, and then we box it. Boils it in oil and cotch in salt water so as it won't rot out. And when you've got an old boat like the Carcom, there's a month's work or more putting her in shape after the winter. But the last two weeks is the worst of it. When you've got to store for a voyage that may last three months, there's a thousand things to put aboard. There's no supermarkets down to Labrador. So what you don't take along of you, you lose without.
And the last of it, everyone gets in a rush because uh, the fishery is a kind of a race, you know. Every boat bound down wants to be first on the fishing grounds. The first ones get the prime berths. That's the best places to set their cod traps. We try to get away around the end of May month. No use going earlier because the pack ice is still too heavy, see? Makes a man hustle when he knows there's maybe a hundred other boats getting ready all along the coast of Newfoundland. There's grub for 15 fellows. Gas and oil, ship stores, fishing gear, tobacco, and a bottle or two of rum if you can find it. There's no end to it. And of course, there's hundreds of little jobs got to be done at the last minute. It all gets done somehow, and by and by, we'd be ready to go north. Now, what about this lumber here? This is for the Ashawanapi, is it? Yeah, that's right. You'll check on that when you come up, will you? Yeah, okay. Yeah, good enough, thank you. Would you like to be going down to Labrador with day this summer? I would if I wouldn't get seasick. This is the last trip of the car, you know, it, uh, sort of a uh, strange and a sad feeling about it because I spent a few years fishing when I, when I was a boy on the Labrador with father. And uh, we got ready in a small vessel, Say all sail, no engines. We had to wait for suitable winds to get north. So it was uh, a very rough summer. Gales of wind day after day. Fish wasn't too plentiful, but uh, we did uh, get a saving voyage. I was only about nine years of age. The fish I jigged myself, that was my income for the trip. Possibly I had $10 when the voyage was over, which was a lot of money in those times. It was the 28th of May when we cast off. There was no big hullabaloo about it, there never is. The women, the kids, they've seen the men go out for Labrador all their lives. There were some other vessels got away before us, but we figured to catch them up. The Carcom's diesels was working smooth, and old as she was, we figured she was good for it. far to find the ice, brother. There was a big berg grounded right at the harbour mouth. But Notre Dame Bay was clear of pack and there was nothing to hang us up. The Labrador fishery came almost to a standstill a few years back. I think uh, the reason for this is that new industries were brought in and uh, fishermen were more or less uh, discouraged on the fishery. They'd sooner get to work uh, in these new industries and uh, stay home with their families, but uh, this didn't prove out. These industries weren't too successful and the men found out that they still had to go fishing. Fishing means more to we than just a job. Most of us would rather be at it than anything else. And the Labrador fishery means more to we than money. Though we hope to make enough from the voyage to carry us through the last part of the year. Now it's more than that. You know you've got to be a man when you goes down to Labrador. And you come back knowing you're as good a man as any that ever sucks their mother's milk. We made a good passage north to St. Anthony, south of the Belle Isle Straits. 
There's no pack ice, just bergs. And you can steer clear of them as long as you seize them. But at night, or when it's thick of fog, they makes bad company. They've killed many a good vessel one time or another. We put into St. Anthony to take on salt for making our salt fish and to top up on fuel oil, it being the last real settlement we'd see all summer. We saw more of it than we'd bargained for. Ships that had sailed ahead of us hoid up in St. Anthony. They'd hit the solid pack just a few miles to the north and been turned back. Now a chance to make the Labrador coast. So all of us had to wait. No way to tell if the ice might be thinning out or driving off the shore to let us through. And then we had some luck. A plane pitched in the harbour just come back from the Labrador. As far as I can see there is that there's ice all the way from, from Nain uh, right down to, to, to Belle Isle and um, it extends um, about four to five miles uh, closely packed to the shore out towards the sea and the outside of that is, is, uh, is open water. If there is a breakage it's going to take us a good many hours to get from here to Grosswater Bay somewhere. So what ice is beyond that I mean is pretty important too because the ice is coming south we had an airplane that came down today, and uh, he tried to land in Port Hope or, or in Hopedale and McCovic and Nain, and, and all these areas were were just just impossible. You know, they were all they, the harbors yeah. were well packed in. You know, <clears throat> I think if the ice stays in on the coast, June month, I think we'll have a poor fishery. That's yeah. what I'd say about it. Yeah. I think it's the same thing. Too. That's right. Well, if the hoist hangs on until the 50th or 20th of June, there'll be no fish caught in June because the hoist will change the temperature of the water and fish is not going to live there, that's for sure. It's going to make the water slubby. Yeah. Hmm. But if we don't get a change of wind, it's going to be a long time before any of the fish is going to get down this year. Well, we just got to have Wesley wind or so we won't get down anyway. Those old vessels can't take it. What the pilot had to tell us sounded bad enough. Skipper Tom got to wondering if there was a chance to get up and look at the ice for his own self. And the pilot said he'd be glad to take Tom alive. Well, there's a few icebergs uh, east of here. So, well, there's no ice. I think it runs from St. Anthony. Uh, out through the harbour, right out um, about 10... The ice in the mouth of Belle Isle Strait didn't look too good to Skipper Tom. It was all big, heavy Arctic pack, you know? The devil's own brew it was. Ten or fifteen feet thick, and able to slice right through the hull of a wooden vessel. Or nipper, maybe, and crush her like a nut. When the plane was on its way back, they run into fog. Ice fog. It come in so thick and so heavy that the pilot had a job to find a place to pitch. Now this is where the most ice is, George. This cuts up the Labrador coast and it cuts across the Straits of Belle Isle. And in this area it's all close back, you see, but there's not too much ice this way. According to the reports, we can go down from White Islands and steer just east of Belle Isle and go on north outside. Uh, that is, providing we can get in on the Labrador coast somewhere. Yes, that's right. Next morning, Skipper George and Skipper Town decided to chance it. Fog or no fog. If we was lucky, We'd get a start on all the other boats and beat them across the Straits to Labrador. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, uh, we got lots of time yet. It's only a couple hours back, so uh, we hang around for a while over it. We made a good try, but it didn't work. The ice got worse and the fog got thicker until you couldn't see the leads at all. It was too much of a chance to take with the old Carcom, so we put back into Carpoon on the south shore of the strait. VCM Bell Isle, VCM Bell Isle, uh, Ashawanabe, over. Ashawanapee, Bell Isle Radio, Roger, go ahead. Ashawanapee back. Good morning, operator. Do you have any uh, hoist report, or is the weather still uh, overcast? Over. Ashawanapee, Bell Isle Radio, uh, negative. Our visibility today is uh, zero, zero, and fog. We can't see a thing here this morning. Over. Uh, Ashawanapee back. Yes, I see. We have much the same. And uh, what is the uh, present forecast for your area? Over. Uh, Roger, Bell Isle area, wind southeasterly 1-5, diminishing to light late this evening, cloudy with occasional showers, patches of mist and fog, visibility 6, lowering to 1 to 3 in showers and mist, and to near zero in fog, temperatures in the 30s. Over. Uh, Hash, I want to be back. Yes, I got you fine, sir. Thanks very much. Uh, that forecast wouldn't be any up to us. Uh, we'd have to wait to the mar and see what the mar brings forth before we can do anything about it. Once you're in the ice, you never know when you'll make the land again. So we spent that day filling our empty water barrels. Next morning, things looked better. We had another try at slipping across the strait. Skipper Tom made shift to go outside the ice this time, east of Belle Isle. There was still plenty of fog and ice, but we made it across and got onto the coast of Labrador. We all felt some good about it until we run head on into the ice again, right into the big pack. Yeah, there's a lot of ice around here now, which is big stuff too, you know, you got to be very careful. Yeah, I see the boats are left Battle Harbor on their way north. Two or three underway up there now, and he left about half an hour ago. Uh, I thought I seen a boat there behind just by what I, I was saying was west, you know. Over. Placentia there, there behind us, uh, he was telling me just now he thought he'd seen us there. He's on his way down. Uh, yeah, we had to cut out here then. We had to cut out here to the east a little bit. Uh, there's some big ice in there on our port. So we're going to swing in again now when we get down the beam of this iceberg. There's a good run there now, so far as I can see. You know, that's how it's going to be from now on. There's going to be water and ice and tight bars and so on. Yeah, I heard on the news about a railway boat to spotted oil in there. Uh, there was a lot of ice and some of the passengers walked ashore on the ice down there. So the ice must be pretty thick down that way. Yeah, good enough. And George, I'll hear from you in an hour's time. So all the best out. We were ahead of the other vessels now, but it didn't look to do us much good. The ice was the heaviest kind. We couldn't push the old carcum into it or we'd have burst her open. There was icebergs foundering, turning over and breaking up. And one piece of uh, what we call a growler, lying low in the water, would hold the carcum like she was made of mud. And there was no harbors to get into. All of them was choked with ice. It was slow going and it was hard. Some days we'd make no more than 15, 20 mile, and it was cold enough to freeze a polar bear. The 
man would have been some glad to have his woman along to keep him warm. We had to change helmsman and look out every hour. But still, we was getting on down and we were still afloat. Starboard. Steady. I suppose the biggest risk we run is if a blow came up and cut us in the pack. The leads would have closed up by then. The ash Anapi might have made out all right, but the Carcom never would have stood the nip. No, I didn't get a forecast. I, I didn't turn on. Uh, did you get one over? Yeah, storm warning out. Uh, storm warning going on small crafts. Uh, 40 miles away, I think. Not only rain and snow tonight. Over. Yes, I see. Uh, that's a bad forecast. Not really gale coming up. I think uh, the best thing we can do is uh, go and uh, anchor dumping for tonight. What do you think? Over. Yeah, well, there's only a few miles up to there, and the wind seems to be pushing pretty fast there, so I guess that's the best thing. Over. So we run in for dumpling and no time to waste. The harbour was icebound and we anchored off and it blew a living storm that night. It parted off one of our chains and we lost it, anchor and all. The other anchor held and coming on morning, the wind fell light and the ice slacked off some. And we got away at dawn. That's how it was for going on a week. The Carcom and the Ashuanope popping in and out of the ice as slippery as a pair of seals and some of the other boats crowding close onto our heels. When we got to Grosswater Bay, there was a big ground swell running. It's all shoal water there, see, and some of the pans was the ground while the rest was moving with the tide. It was like two millstones and we was the car. We had to dodge about right smart, never knowing if we'd fetch up on one of the sunkers back at George's Island. Some say pirates used to moor at George's once, but what kind of foolishness would bring a pirate to a place like this when he could have been sailing south in the Caribbean waters? That's how you said the glass. <coughs> yes, boy, that's how you said yeah. I guess we go to George's Island. Yeah, we'll let go get some of that pirate money. Yeah. I used to get the shovel by and go up and dig some of those doors up. I had digging, I guess, up there in the rocks. No, but it's up down the ledge. <laughs> I know it was there. Once clear of George's, we was inside the house and into a stretch of open water. There was a lot of boats driving hard to catch us up, so Skipper Tom gave the carcom all she'd take. She creaked and groaned a bit, but she held her own. She was still good for it. She was the first to cross Grosswater Bay that night. We'd anchored in the run at Ice Tickles, and there we stuck. The wind was on the land, and off White Bear Island there was a river of ice four miles wide, packed so tight an otter couldn't have squeezed between the pans. Us and some other boats was all hung up together with nothing to do but sleep and eat. We were some tired of salt beef by then, so some of us just sort of found some ducks.
It was no hardship on the men, you know, but it was hard for the skippers. Time was going fast, and the ice seemed worse than ever. There was no proper shelter in ice tickles. It was a bad place to lie, with so much ice on the go. That was changing the wind, still up in the nards. Yes, boy, we could have a change of wind before that ice moves off. Yeah. It's the window back around to the western. We're going to be there for a long time. I don't see any hope until it comes from the western. Evening of the fifth day, we get a change of wind, offshore it is, driving the ice out of the landward bays, the tide setting in toward the land, bringing the heavy pack ice with it, and the boats in the middle. The ice seems slow moving, but in no time at all it is upon us, and there's some scramble. We runs all the boats together in one clump for what little protection we could get. not a bloody thing that we can do. Just hope the boats will stay afloat until the tide changes and the pressure eases up. Some of us older chaps remember the spring a long time back when a dozen ships was crushed in ice tickles and the tide's not due to change till 12 o'clock. Quite a whirlwind we had last night. Yeah. There's a change, way. though. The wind is down this morning. Yes, yeah, it'll be better by it was after a while. Yeah. After a couple of days of westerly wind, I suppose we'll get a move. My son, that was some close, but the ice had eased in time. We figured we'd got off with nothing but some paint tore off. A couple of days later, the wind come westerly and the skipper started to get underway. When we hauled the Corkham's one remaining anchor, it was all bust up. A big pan must have grounded right on top of it and smashed the stock in half. By rights, that anchor never should have held. When we was in the whirlpool, it should have dragged and let the vessel drive ashore. Well, with a westerly wind, a shore lead opened up and the other boats made off for Cave Harrison, where we was bound, but not the Corkham. <laughs> It would have been the worst sort of foolishness to have gone out with nary an anchor left. So we had to spend the most of the day making and fitting a new stock. By the time that job was done, the ice was moving in again, and we had the devil's own time to shove our way out of it. <laughs> Several ships gone ahead of us by now, and Skipper Tom was none too well pleased. Still, we was luckier than some. Negotiations are proceeding. 
Last night, the 35-ton schooner, Joan and Arthur, out of Salem come by, was crushed in the ice and sunk 40 miles north of Battle Harbor. Captain Rowe and his crew of five spent the night on an ice pan and got to the Labrador coast this morning in their small boat. Everything else was lost. In Montreal, students... That night, we sheltered under Holton Island. It was the 14th day of June. We'd been underway for 16 days and gone just 400 miles. Cape Harrison was only 40 miles north, but we'd lost our chance. The ice was tight to the shore again. The Notre Dame had weathered the Cape, and there was others close up to her. We knowed we had to think of something or stand to lose the best trap berths. It was Skipper Tom who turned the trick. He decided to send a trap boat on ahead to take our berths. She had a chance to wiggle through where the Corkum never could. The mate in three hands was told off to go and take along the main trap moorings. They was to put these on the shore opposite where we'd want to set our traps to show the berths was ours. We wished them luck knowing they'd need it. That boat was only an eggshell. They'd only had to graze one ice clumper, and that would have been the end of her. Yeah. If the water leads had closed up, they'd have to haul out on a pan and sit there till the ice opened up. Supposing it took a week. You'd never have called it a holiday jaunt, but for them lads it was sport. The mate, who'd been a sealer half his life, he scunned her through. But they couldn't get around the Cape for solid ice, so they landed on the eastern side. All they could do was walk three miles across to where the Notre Dame was anchored, borrow a boat and some leaders off of her, and mark our berths. Like the old fellow said, there's more than one way to skin a cod. Uh, Notre Dame, Carlton, yeah. I'll get you fine, Rolly. There was a boat left there this morning on her way over there. A boat left on her way over to... Did she arrive over? Yeah, I'll get you fine, Tom. I'll get that boat signed up, old man. There's a boat never, but... Uh, but the ice was tight there, and uh, the boat stayed back, so I think they're figuring they might get down by and by. So I think it'll be all right over. Uh, Notre Dame, car from back. Yes, I got you fine, Rolly, yeah. Good enough, then. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think we could move along a few miles this evening now. It's just too late, see, old man. It's just too late to make a move. Uh, so uh, we're going to try it in the morning. I see the forecast wants an hour-west wind tomorrow, 30, over. The worst of the voyage down north was over now. A day or two later, the wind come off the land and we could poke along down to Harrison.
She's a hard-looking place, the Cape, but one of the best on the Labrador for fish. If the fish strikes in, more times they do, sometimes they don't. It's all part of the gamble. This year, the ice been so bad and the season so late, well, there's no way to tell. Anyway, we'd made it down. Now there's nothing to do but wait for the fish to come. Last year, we only had to wait four days. We kept busy when we could. We set out our trap moorings, but it was no use to set the traps. The ice would have tore them up, and anyway, there was no fish. It was a wearying time. The men, being shermen, stood to get nothing for their summer voyage unless we got into the fish. For the owners, it was no better. They paid the shot to buy the grub and all, and we fellas all had hearty appetites. Every day, we'd go off in the trap boats to jig for cod. If there was any fish around, the jigger would have brought them up, and then we'd set our nets. But all we got was a scattering of little tom cod, not worth their salt. Go on, my son, go down for another year. By the 10th of July month, we'd been waiting three long weeks, and things were looking pretty black. We set one trap. But the next day, the ice come in and tore it all to hell. Gave us something to do, though, mending it. Mostly, time hung very heavy on our hands. So one Sunday, some of us went up the Tushialik River for some trout. There was no shortage of trout. We set a net and got into some big sea trout. Finest kind. But apart from what we could eat and what we could put down in salt to take home for winter time, there was no use to us. It was codfish we'd come after, and there weren't no cod. Oh, 
But songs don't fill fish holes, and they don't pay grocery bills. Some of the men were getting right faint-hearted. Oh, I miss waiting to get a sign of fish here Monday, now that the ice is cleared off, you know. And the last of the toys now is this week. I think the chances for any big lot of fish is pouring out. Although it's, you could get some. Things happen that way, but after once July comes in down here and it's all ice. There's not too much got here. Or anywhere. I ain't going home myself when the steamer comes now. Uh, Ashwanapi, back to the Noni. Uh, uh, what time do you expect to arrive at Cape Arizon? Cap, over. Uh, Noni is back. Uh, we should be there in another two hours. Another two hours, over. Uh, Ashwanapi, back. Yes, I see. And uh, what is the uh, hoist situation north uh, at present? Cap, over. On the 12th day of July, my birthday, something happened that never happened down the Labrador before. Eleven shearmen out of four vessels at Harrison gave up the voyage. These men, mostly young fellows, decided to go home board of the Noni, the summer passenger boat, when she put into Harrison on her way south. Nobody blamed them for quitting, but it made things harder on all of us who stayed behind. Yes, boy, it's, it's looking bad. There's no fish, you know. We've been there now for over a month. But we haven't had any chance being all ice, but uh, this last three or four days, the weather been good. No ice should have got a sign of fish by now. Last year this time, so we had around 1,500 cattle to fish. So that's a lot of difference in this year. I guess that's the reason, too, the crew were getting discouraged. Last year was such a early year, and this year is a real late one. It makes that much difference, see? Just figure the fish is not coming, and one or two fellows get talking and discourage some more. And yeah. Probably when the next steamer go back now, yeah. so many more guys will be gone. If there's eight or ten men leaving some schooners, nothing else to do, and you just got to quit and go on. I mean, you can't, you can't add three or four cod traps with five or six men. It's impossible. So uh, just, you'll have to call the bad boys and that's it. Two men have decided to call it quit. That leaves us short-handed. We have uh, three cod traps. We're not going to be able to use any more than two. And uh, this is a very serious problem. <laughs> Well, right now it's looking pretty grim. It's the 13th of July, and uh, so far we haven't got haven't got a card yet. But uh, some of the older skippermen say that we could, uh, if it come in now for too long, we could have probably three weeks or months of good fishing. It wasn't until the 25th of July the fish struck in. Too little and too late. The capelin, the little bait fish that usually comes to shore in millions, bringing the cod with them, never came at all. God knows where they went, but wherever it was, most of the cod went with them. What few fish came to Cape Harrison was small and poor. With no capelin to feed on, they was eating kelp, seaweed. And when they got to eat kelp, they got to starve. Short-handed like we was, we couldn't set out all our traps. 
It made no matter. There wasn't fish enough to keep a blind old woman busy anyhow. Well, we'd done the best we could. We split our fish and salted what we got. Down in the hole, salt bulk is what we call it, we had about 700 kentles stowed away, about a fifth of what we got last year. Then the night of August the 8th, Skipper Tom got some news on the radio. The price of salt bulk fish had been cut right square in half. That was a hard knock, but we never give up, even then. <laughs> 